I'm Mike Doherty. I'm the uh, epilepsy director for Swedish here, and I'm going to be talking on birds today, not on epilepsy in part because I couldn't get any of my colleagues to do a talk on epilepsy. Most of them are away. Uh, so you're stuck with a bird talk, and I hope I can share my enthusiasm for this with you guys. So I have no disclosures for this talk. This talks on lateralization, and specifically when you think about lateralization of brain function, there's a few things that come to mind. Handedness, language dominance, verbal memory, or perhaps the three that are most uh, lateralized in our functions. It means that one side of your brain disproportionately is responsible for those abilities. And most of us, I would venture to say, don't really have a good idea why our brains lateralize. And uh, that's going to be one of the topics of today, trying to understand why through looking at bird models. Specifically, osprey, uh, though later pigeons and chickens. And we're going to review several studies on bird uh, lateralization, both in behavior and in physiology. Uh, we're going to discuss the implications for human brain networks, and we're going to talk about some vocabulary that I'd like you all to learn by the end of the lecture, because there will be a test. Um, lateralization studies really started with Paul Broca, who in 1865 described a series of patients who had problems expressing themselves. In specific, um, one patient named Tan uh, who was called Tan because the sum total of his ability to speak was reduced to that one word, Tan, over time. He presented his findings to the Anthropological Society in Paris on a series of patients who had damage to the third convolution of the inferior left frontal lobe. And that area from then on has been given the namesake of Broca's uh, area for the motor production of speech. And when damaged, we're not able to ex express ourselves well. It turns out Broca scooped another guy by the name of Mark Dax, who had described the same area about 25 years earlier, but had never published it and died before Broca published his work. Uh, Dax's son later went on to publish his work. But if we were historically uh, forgiving, we'd call this Dax's area, not Broca's area. Most of us, when learning neurology, were taught um, in the C. Miller Fisher type uh, discipline of learning neurology stroke by stroke, um, meaning learning how the brain is built by subtraction and damage rather than um, the normal physiology. And I certainly had that beat into me at Tufts Medical School because a lot of the folks uh, who were there, Tom Saban, um, Lou Kaplan, Alan Roper, were all disciples of C. Miller Fisher. But there's a lot more we can extract in terms of building models of neurologic function from what we have today versus what we had in 1860 or even 1960. So we're going to start with observation. So in my off time, I like to go fishing. And one of the areas I like to fish is in the estuarine areas around Puget Sound. Um, particularly in the industrial areas. So this is the Everett waterfront, and I'm often up really early in my kayak, paddling around. It's gloomy. The uh, piers embedded in the tidal mud are sometimes capped with nests. Those piers are vestiges of our, of our industrial uh, production of wood and logging and timber and so forth. And those piers are used in the Everett waterfront just as they are on the Fraser River and other large river systems in the Pacific Northwest for anchoring log rafts. And they're still there today, and there's lots and lots of them. And on top of those piers are often large nests. Those nests are about four foot wide and two foot high, and they're nests for osprey. There's an osprey flying down towards the nest. And you can see a couple characteristics to the nest. It's got a 360 viewing platform to look all about. There's an osprey just hanging out on one of those uh, log raft poles. By the way, they still use these poles to tier the uh, log rafts, too. You see them still in use today. So we're going to talk about this guy, the Western Osprey, in terms of an observation study that some of us here at Swedish did in our off time, I should say, Tom Higgins. Uh, 
The uh, sea hawk, river hawk, or fish hawk are other names for the western osprey. The osprey is a, a gorgeous bird. It's a worldwide distribution except for Antarctica. Um, it's semi-altricial, which means it spends a lot of time in the nest with its parents before it fledges. They weigh between two and four and a half pounds. They're food snobs. They exclusively feed on live fish. Um, they have closable nostrils, an oily plumage that allows them to dive, and they have trabeculae on the feet. So ignore the talons for a second, but look at the sort of goosenecked or uh, goose-bumped skin there. That skin has trabeculae on it or little gripping-like um, orientations that help them grab fish. They're loyal. They mate for life. The chicks fledge after about eight to 10 weeks. Fledge means leave the nest. And they have uh, a coal-like patterning of dark bands behind the eye, as well as an orbital ridge to prevent glare and to see better. Their migration routes are extraordinary. So uh, I haven't seen any yet this year, but they're on the way back. Uh, this is from April 9th, at least, from one of the bird tracking sites. You can see, um, where is he, Marcus here? flying up from sub-Saharan Africa over the Sahara, and these other birds, Callie and Elena, flying up over the Mediterranean up to northern Europe as of April 9th. What's interesting about that migratory map is these birds aren't shy to fly over areas with no fish or to fly over vast distances of ocean. And you can see uh, Holly on the east coast here moving between, say, the Chesapeake and Brazil. They do similar flights on the west coast between here and uh, California and South and Central America. Anyway, when I'm out fishing and catching nothing, it's humbling to see these guys catch tons of fish, but it's also really fun. These are spectacular predators to watch. They dive down from a height of about 80 feet, um, grab the fish underwater, and then fly their way out of the water with the fish in tow, oriented beneath them, back to either a perch or a nest to eat the fish. So if you think about that, 80 feet, that's, we're probably about 90 feet here, but 80 feet down to ground level, straight down. They have to account for the different densities of air and water and what that does to light to catch the fish. In other words, Snell's Law. Uh, there's also a test on that, by the way. Uh, but if you add to it, what's more complicated about their pursuit of the fish, they're also flying typically into the wind. There's, in these estuarine habitats that I'm going to, there's two layers of water. There's basically a freshwater lens on top of a saltwater layer that has different densities. There's a current that the fish is facing, the fish may be moving, there may be waves, um, there may be clouds, there may be refraction of light off the waves, et cetera. So it's a complex calculus this bird does while diving down. And how fast are they going from 80 feet to surface of the water? It's around 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour. And it takes around two seconds. So when they're diving down, they have their talons extended. Um, their nostrils close. You can't see that here, but uh, a nictitating membrane closes over the eye, and we'll see that in a second. And they have a four-talon grip. The fourth talon on the osprey is rather unique. Like the owl, the uh, osprey has a ability to move its third digit around to the base of the hand. So hold your hands up for a second. So. Birds have, these sorts of birds, or birds, perching birds, have four uh, toes. So hold your pinky all the way down on your palm. And then your first digit and your index finger, they can make a loop there. Imagine for a second that you could make that same kind of loop with your ring finger and your middle finger. And that's what the osprey can do. It can rotate that ring finger all the way around to make a similar OK loop to grasp the fish in various positions, which is unique. 
and in that only other owls have that. So if you think about, say, uh, opposable thumbs and primates, and oh, isn't that a distinguishing characteristic? Well, these guys can do what's one better. They can actually move their finger to a vastly different position and use it very effectively for grasping. That's called zygodactyly. There's a whole discipline in birding on anisodactyly and zygodactyly, which is more than you want to know. But it's, uh, if you're interested, you can find a lot on this. Um, here's a picture of an osprey emerging from the water. You can just get a hint of the nictitating membrane on the eyeball there. There's a better picture here that's that bluish sheen um, on the eye in these two pictures. You don't see it on this picture. So that's a vestigial membrane we also have that lives down kind of in the corner, mesial corner of our eye that acts in the birds as a third eyelid to prevent damage to the eye when it smashes into the water. You'll also see that on sharks um, and things like snakes and other uh, reptiles. Note how narrow the body is. They're pursuing, just like I am, Oncorhynchus clarki clarki, at least up here in uh, the Pacific Northwest. This is the coastal cutthroat trout. This is a migratory trout that moves in and out of fresh and salt water. They typically, osprey at least, typically love to eat ones at around 28 centimeters. And the estimated weight for 28 centimeter coastal cutthroat is around 275 grams, or 0.6 pounds. So imagine for a second that you're diving from 80 feet up, grabbing a fish that's weighing about one-fifth of your body weight and then flying out of the water. That's how powerful these birds are in terms of their catch. It's about 12 minutes per fish, which is extraordinarily humbling for me. <laughs> and they're successful about one out of every four dives. It's truly a fun bird to watch. If you uh, are down at Green Lake, probably in the next few weeks when the osprey are up and the fish have just been stocked by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, they will come and just pick these brand new fish right out of the water. Um, and you'll see it happen in short duration. It's literally 12 minutes they're gonna be diving. But back to the neurology. What's interesting here about this picture? apart from it being a cool picture by Steve Shin. This is probably the only animal that we're aware of that has a stance preference while flying prey. So it means that it's holding the fish with one foot in front of the other, which means there has to be some lateralized decision that it makes to put which foot in front and which foot behind. So in board sports, we know there's stance preferences for various sports like surfing and snowboarding. In surfers, 65% of them are left foot forward, right foot back, which is known as a conventional stance. In this picture, this is a right foot forward, left foot back stance known as goofy foot. Goofy foot terminology is also used for snowboarding. And snowboarders, or at least really good snowboarders, are a little bit more goofy footed than surfers. In skateboarders, it's a different mix. But in general, this ratio of 65-35 keeps coming up in the uh, board sport literature, which is also pretty thin. If you're interested in doing a study on board sports, a review of stances in those sports hasn't been published. But what we decided to do, Alan Holtner, uh, Laura Allen, Katie Morrison, Wesley Scott, myself, we decided to look at images of osprey catching fish based on various search engines and just classify which foot was forward and which foot was back, just to see whether or not they were goofy footed. And uh, we were able to, we used the four different search engines, this one unironically, DuckDuckGo, uh, Yahoo, Bing, Go, Google, and a fourth way of, uh, a fifth, I'm sorry, a fourth way of doing it through a photo sharing site on Facebook called Ospreys Only. So you can imagine if you put osprey catching fish into any of these, you might end up getting a similar picture possibly by the same photographer. So the rule was you had to classify 50 birds with one photographer and one bird per photographer so that there wasn't overlap. In the ospreys only, that same rule applied, but the, the Facebook web sharing site allows you to look at multiple pictures over a year's worth of acquisition. So there's lots of folks who are uploading pictures of birds on this site. So it's a little bit different in that this is a unique data set that did not overlap with these data. 
Um, and what we found was basically in all of the data sets, the percent of left foot forward, right foot back, or conventional stance varied between 64 and 78 percent. So we're back to that 65-35 ratio. Um, and that the significance of that ratio was pretty solid. That stance in the osprey has a preference for a conventional stance in holding fish. So what about if the bird was holding with one foot? It turns out with one foot there was no difference. There's fewer pictures of the birds with one foot, but they don't have a preference if they're holding with one foot. So why would Osprey have a stance preference. So if you watch a lot of Planet Earth and Richard Attenborough stuff, um, typically it boils down to animal behavior being uh, avoiding getting eaten, breeding, um, or eating. So let's take the uh, breeding part out of it for the moment, because it's probably unlikely this has much to do with breeding. But the front foot were postulating, we don't know this for sure, but we're postulating the front foot goes close to the head to try and kill the fish as quickly as possible. The fish's brain is about where the tip of the arrow is. Um, and we wonder, though we don't know, whether or not the talon and its movement, whether they have a preference for which exact talon kills the fish. But the speculation is the front foot goes on the fish's head to help kill it. So that's called pithing. When you push something through a brain quickly, it'll pith the brain and stop it from working. So here's some pictures of uh, that front foot preference for one foot grabs. And another example here. Well, what about the back foot? Why does it put the back foot here? So the dorsal fin of the fish is right here. In, Trout swim in what's called a subcharangiform pattern, which is also on the vocab list. So charangiform means mainly from the midpoint backwards in motion. So charangiform fish movements, for example, in tuna are mainly the back part of the fish propelling the fish. But in a rainbow trout like this guy um, right here, the pattern is a writhing movement with a hinge-like movement in the middle of the fish. So if it puts its back foot on the middle of the hinge, it's going to be less mobile. It's also going to be closer to the center of gravity. But why stance? Why, why even do that? So to pull a fish out of the water, fish typically, the ones that the osprey are pursuing, will only swim forward, just like a bird will only fly forward. To get the fish out of the water, one advantage that it would have is if it pushes its back leg down and pulls its front leg up, so that the fish, if still alive, is actually trying to escape by pushing itself up towards the surface of the water, and in so doing, also carrying the bird a little bit. So the resistance in bringing the fish out of the water is lower when it does that. There's a nice picture here of that. The bottom or back foot is straightened, and the front foot is flexed. So the fish are brought back to a perch. Uh, we speculate the landings are typically with dead fish because those perches, if you lose the fish because it's flopping around, means that's way more work. Um, they have no preference on landing, and they typically chew the head off first when eating. And I think this is because the talons are so sharp and the head is so resistant that they really have to pull it out of the cartilage of the fish head. So there's a lot of pictures on the web of headless fish being flown around by osprey that are kind of gory after you look at about 500 of them. <laughs> it's rare to beach or ground uh, eat. The osprey typically doesn't do this. So this is John Gould. John Gould is the British version of John Audubon, who did an enormous number of bird prints in Britain. So this is an idealized or romanticized picture of what an osprey might do. They don't typically eat on the beach. They eat on a perch and watching for predators. Here's an example of a headless fish shot. So we're talking about predators. So what, what predators are we talking about? We're talking about bald eagles typically on this part of the coast in the northwest around the Snohomish River Delta. There's an enormous number of bald eagles, just like there's an enormous number of osprey. And bald eagles steal fish from osprey, and that's called a kleptoparasitic attack, which is a great word to describe a lot of people in you know, other ways. <laughs> so this one I definitely want you to 
uh, remember kleptoparasite. It's, it's, a, it's a succinct and nice little insult. <laughs> In any case, if, if you're lucky enough to see one of these dogfights between a bald eagle and an osprey, you'll see the osprey dodge and weave and carry the fish. And the only way it's going to be able to do that quickly and effectively is if the fish is not having much resistance to the air and if the fish isn't writhing a lot. If it is, the osprey will typically drop the fish. And you'll see around Green Lake or Haller Lake or a lot of the smaller lakes, you can often see in May in particular, the osprey getting pursued by the bald eagle, getting pursued by the crow, getting pursued by the seagull. So I've seen this at least twice on, on Green Lake where you have all four birds chasing what they hopefully will get from the osprey, a scrap of fish. This is a spectacular shot from Dick Fountainrot. Um, you can see the osprey here carrying the fish, and behind it is a juvenile bald eagle. And in the wing widths, you can see the difference between the osprey, which has a much narrower wing, and even in the juvenile bald eagle, a much broader or wider wing. And um, even with the exaggeration you get from a telephoto picture, uh, this is true. The osprey have relatively narrow wings that help them get out of the water. So let's go back to the kleptoparasite for a second. Look how the bald eagle carries fish. It's just stupid. I mean, it just, it just doesn't make sense um, why you would fly like that unless you were a monster of an animal that just was really powerful. And this is Ben Franklin on bald eagles. You've probably seen this quote before, but Ben Franklin basically says, I wish the bald eagle hadn't been chosen as a representative of our country. He's a bird of bad moral character. He doesn't get his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree where, too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has at length taken his fish and is bearing it to his nest for the support of his mate and young ones, it pursues him and takes it from him. With all this injustice, he is never in good case, but like those among men who live by sharping and robbing, he is generally poor and often very lousy. I love that quote. I think it's very funny. Uh, anyway, so back to the nest. Um, the bald eagle is less likely to attack a fish on an uh, 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 osprey at nest with the fish if they have a free talon, because these are sharp, vicious talons. So let's come back to the lateralization part, because that's what we're here for. So lateralization brain functions permit multitasking. They help facilitate communication, precise movements, and intelligence in at least humans. In the osprey's case, we postulate the stance allows it to remove the fish efficiently from the water. It may help kill the fish in flight. It helps avoid kleptoparasitism and allows it to arrive at the nest with food. So it has a clear survival advantage to do this. So let's segue off birds for a second over to humans. So Raymond um, postulated a while back that a boxer's stance is a survival advantage. So in boxing, uh, there's a stance either left fist forward, left foot forward, right fist forward, right foot forward. And what they were able to show in nonviolent tribes, for instance, in Burkina Faso, the murder rate is 1 in 100,000. And lefties make up around 3.4% of the population. Who's left-handed in the room, by the way? Could you just lay, raise your hand? OK. So I got to be, I don't want to offend anyone here. <laughs> My wife's left-handed, too. Uh, it, it, the Yanomami tribe in Venezuela, however, there's more than 500 in 100,000 meet a violent end each year. Left-handers account for 22.6% of the population. So either there's a survival advantage for lefties, or somehow the environment where there's more lefties is more violent. <laughs> <laughs> um, in other sports, uh, being left-footed or left-handed clearly has an advantage when you've practiced your entire life against right-handed or right-footers. So here's Arjun Robin, whose signature move is racing down the right wing and striking the ball with his left foot and crossing into the right into the other side of the goal here. He typically a right winger. I used to play soccer as a right winger. A right winger will run all the way down here and kick the ball over to these two guys. But his move is to move over and use his left foot to score, because these guys are not quite as prepared for that attack. Uh, 
in, in baseball terms, a left-handed pitcher is just a lot more effective at looking at first base, picking off runners, and facing right-handed batters because they're not quite as prepared after decades of training against righties. So here's your sport test. What's wrong with this picture? Um, let's go back to stance for a minute. So um, this stance is going to fail. This is an idealized version. Surfing, you can't stand with your feet together because the board will slip out from under you or the board will bury into the nose. Uh, the nose of the board will bury into the wave and you'll fall off. So you need that back foot in the back part of the board to slow the board down. Uh, so when we're talking about stance left, right, it's important to just bear in mind we're also talking about anterior, posterior weight distribution. Furthermore, stance isn't just footedness. It's axial tone, arm position, head position. Um, it's much more complicated than just straight up footedness. So yeah, he's dysmorphic even for a Queenslander. So my parents were born in Queensland, so I feel you know, I have an Australian passport, so I feel that it's my place to make fun of people from Queensland. That's, that's a reasonable place to be in. Hopefully, I'm not offending any. The only other Southern Hemisphere person here was uh, Monteith. And, uh, so it, I think it's OK to make fun of Queenslanders. Let's talk about other Queensland birds. These are uh, budgies, budgerigars. And uh, what about direction? Do, do birds have a preference that they might move to in pursuit or when being pursued. So these guys, Bahagavatula and Srinivasan, did a box study where they had a box interrupted by a passage that had two widths, a wider width and a narrow width on the left and right side. And they repeatedly test birds and let them fly through the box to see which side they preferred to take. And what they found was that most of the time, the birds just opted for the wider passage, but there was a subset that consistently went left and a subset that consistently went right, regardless of how wide the passage was, which implies they have a flight preference over time to move towards one side. That's one bird in a box. It doesn't describe flocking behaviors, which are extraordinarily complicated. In flocking behaviors, the goal isn't to separate yourself from the flock, it's to stick with it. And if you've ever seen a murmuration of dunlings or of starlings, they're just really fun to watch. They're probably easiest to see for dunlings out here around areas like the Fraser Delta and the Snohomish Delta. They're a small white coastal bird. They move in these clouds that are symmetric and sinuous and really spectacular. So. How do you detect threat to escape from? Or how do you not fly into your friend? So this is where we, we dive into visual processing and birds, because this gets really fun. Bird vision. Bird vision is different to how we see things. So their left eye projects mainly to the right brain and the right eye to the left brain. There's not much of a chiasmatic cross that gives dual projection images back to the visual processing regions, at least in the first order neurons. Um, it's a smaller area of the bird that has a binocular field. They have very wide uh, peripheral vision. And in uh, raptors like osprey and owls, typically they can't move the eyeball much. It's stuck in a tubular pipe of bone. They can't move the eye from side to side. That's why when you see owls, the owls are moving their head uh, almost in 360 degrees. It's spectacular how far they can move their head to see. And they have to do that because their eyes are fixed. They have to use the head movement to move the eyes. I'm not going to go into the uh, uh, patterning of retinal cell layers and so forth. Suffice it to say that uh, birds, especially raptors, have enormous power in visual resolution based on the cell layers they have back here that vastly dwarfs our own. I'm going to jump instead to pigeons and chickens, much less glamorous birds, I suppose, but a lot more work's been done on these birds because they're easier to work with. So this is poopy butt. Um, I put a classy font on it because it's a classy name. This is Dr. Chong's chicken, and she graciously lent me the pictures to illustrate uh, chicken physiologies. So here's poopy butt again, like a, a glamour shot. <laughs> so chicks develop 
lateralized visual functions dependent on the exposure of the unhatched chick to light, particularly on days 19 to 21. So right at the tail end, just about prior to hatching. It's the exposure to light that a chick has that helps it begin to map out pathways that are known as the thalamofugal or thalamic to foregrain, forebrain pathways. And typically in an egg, the left eye is buried down into the rest of the body while the right eye is exposed to the egg. So light will come through an egg and help establish and build pathways for that chicken's brain wiring. And we know that because you raise a chick in darkness, they won't show preferences. Some of the preferences, so right eye to left hemisphere, lets you detect the difference between grain and food, or sand. Um, I'm sorry, grain and pebbles and things. Uh, the left eye to the right hemisphere allows you to gauge for predator or, fen or friend or copulation and attack. So it turns out the left hemisphere also acts to inhibit the right hemisphere. So that if you cover the right eye and approach a chick, it will attempt to attack or copulate with you. If you cover the left eye or have both eyes uncovered, it will not. So in the chick, the left hemisphere is a little bit dominant. In the pigeon, it's slightly different. They have a more complicated but similar orientation of the chick in the egg. I I think this is the beak tucked in here, and that's the right eye up. But the pigeons also develop pathways that are initiated through eye exposure through the egg to light that are different. They're not thalamofugal. They're called tectofugal. And it's probably beyond the capacity for most of us, certainly beyond me, to explain this. But basically, the left side gets more bilateral inputs that involve the forebrain of the pigeon than in the chicken, but also the left side is dominant. So what does that mean for the pigeon, though? Pigeons have more forebrain inputs. They have a better ability to memorize visual inputs and build maps than with the right eye to the left brain. Um, they also have a better ability to detect friend and foe, specifically during flight. They'll fly to the right of their friends meaning it's the left eye that sees their friend over to um, the, their left, the friend's right. And the right brain typically identifies um, friend or foe. Just to contrast, obviously for us, light is not involved in embryologic development, as far as we know, uh, for lateralizing us. But what we do know is that there's axes, obviously, front to back, left to right, up to down. And there's nodal signaling cascades that help establish left-right differences in the lateral mesoderm. Um, it requires a lot of um, neurotrophic factors and nodal genes in the lateral plate mesoderm that involve gene products that are actually pushed to the left by ciliary motions. So we have tiny little cilia in our embryologic development that help push fluid towards one side that helps us begin to map out left-right differences, which I think is just fascinating to think that fluid flow and gene expression uh, of how uh, fluid flows to one side or the other may start some of our lateralization. So let's talk, again, back to birds for a second, precocial versus altricial. So precocial birds are ones that are typically born pretty much ready to go, ready to feed, ready to eat. Uh, they don't spend time in the nest. They don't need much parental support. And at least in the US, there's no US birds that are purely precocial. Versus altricial birds are birds that typically do require some time in the nest, learning, habituating. They're born with their eyes closed. They um, begin to mimic. They have abilities to build maps and navigation. Um, and then the most altricial of them, the songbirds, can sing and learn language uh, or their version of language. They can navigate at night as well. So a, a degree of sophistication that changes in birds depending on how long they spend in the nest, but also post-birth. Uh, neurogenesis continues for these birds, whereas these birds, it sort of turns off earlier. So the chicken is considered semi-precocial. The pigeon is not. It's considered altricial. So you could say, well, that's just a nature versus nurture problem. Mm, probably not. 
it's more of a nature versus way more nature. Pigeons, so let's stick with pigeons for a second and talk about that homing ability specifically, that map building ability, because that's really unique um, to how these birds navigate, and it gives us a good idea of how birds might migrate. So navigation of pigeons, so most of you know that you can put a pigeon, a homing pigeon, in a new or novel environment, and you can race them back to their home and see who gets their fastest, because the birds will find their way home. You know, it's very popular in Europe, not so popular here, but homing pigeons can do that because they have two different map mechanisms that they build. One is a navigational map, kind of a, a global GPS for novel locations. So those are called compass mechanisms, and some of the ways that the pigeon can navigate back um, involve sextant-like abilities to determine where the sun is in the sky versus uh, the angle um, of shadows and things like that. Uh, they also have magnetic abilities. There's magnetite in the beaks of birds, especially the pigeon, that may help it orient towards magnetic uh, compass lines. And there may be proteins that also have magnetic effects in the retinas and or the olfactory cilia that change depending on orientation. For songbirds, I put it in parentheses here because it's not strictly true for pigeons, but they may also have a star compass where they're able to celestially navigate based on star positions and things like that. A lot of the birds that move through here migrating up to Alaska and back uh, are nocturnal migrators. And you can see in fall on the radar, there's clouds of birds coming overnight that you never really see, at, often at high altitude. Others have postulated that odor fits part of the navigational map. Um, the second map is one that might be more familiar to most of us. That's what we see every day and orients us to where we are and that we can use familiar landmarks to guide us back home. So you can lesion pigeons in the hippocampus, and if you lesion them early in the left side, they don't home. They won't find their way home from a novel location. Uh, if you lesion the right hippocampus, they can home. So it implies that the left hippocampus is useful for their navigational map building. What I thought was really interesting, the hippocampus of the pigeon may only have inputs from the vision and olfactory cortices. That gets important when we think about language in a couple minutes. It turns out we may have a magnetic ability too in a study that just came out. Uh, they put, I think these guys are down in California somewhere, they put folks in a kind of Faraday cage where they were isolated from electromagnetic signals. And they moved the cage itself and were able to demonstrate changes in alpha bands in EEG. So that's about as close as to epilepsy as we're going to get. But uh, we may have a vestigial kind of magnetic orientation that we're not particularly aware of. I would argue that over time, our ability to navigate successfully is being eroded or changed by the use of uh, GPS or location finding devices that tell us where to go rather than us orienting for a map. So over time, we're more adept at hearing directions and following them than we are navigating on our own. Uh, at least in folks that I've talked to. Who uses maps here to, to, to navigate? I got, I got one guy who flies, and Tara. <laughs> uh, any case, back to Broca then. So is the most lateralized of our human functions language? Um, why can parrots learn language, and why can't chimps? So this study by Fanning et al. basically took vari <laughs> various species of birds, like a finch, budgie, um, pigeon, dove, quail, and compared motor and other areas used in speech for humans with candidate zones in those same animals to look at gene expression. And this looks really complicated, so we're not going to go all through it, but basically what they're able to see is that for songbirds, like the finch, the budgie, and the hummingbird, gene expressions were similar to humans in various candidate areas for, lo for speech localization, whereas non-songbirds, like doves and quails, those same gene expressions were much, much lower uh, 
than humans or those um, language using birds. I'm using language and song interchangeably here, by the way. So they postulated that, okay, uh, to orient you here, this is anterior, 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 that in songbirds there's way more connection pathways between the forebrain and the striatum and the pallidum than there are in chickens, for instance, that have you know, virtually no connections to those locations. And similarly, they're postulating that, say, in humans who clearly have language, there's way more connections to the forebrain, the striatum, and the pallidum than there are in the macaque or monkey. So not only are the pathways more complex in songbirds and humans, but they're also ventralized. So we've been talking about lateralization left, right. And when you remember talking back, back about stance, there's also forward, backward aspects to stance that are important that we tend to overlook. So in a primate, most of the functions are spread out all over the place. And again, this is anterior in this picture as opposed to the last one. Anterior, all these functions are spread out over the cortex. Where, say, in a crow or a corvid, most of the functions are ventralized or anterior in location. So you got a lot more interesting stuff packed up in the front of the brain than you do in a primate, in a bird. The other part that gets really interesting for, say, the MS folks among us, so we have laminated cell clusters, six cell layers, um, with white matter connections going to other gray matter nuclei. Birds don't. They have way more dense neuronal uh, functioning where gray matter basically connects straight up to gray matter without much white matter at all, which means they can pack way more cells much denser into a much smaller brain. So birds have been able to show over 300 million years when we were last really related to birds. Over 300 million years, they've had convergent evolution to sing or use a form of language. So how does stance or footedness influence that? It turns out that this has been studied widely in parrots, for instance, in the African gray parrot. The parrots that prefer to hold food with the left leg or perch with the right leg had way better vocabulary than the parrots who showed no preference. So those parrots who showed lateralization preferences were much, much better at learning language. So it turns out that uh, presumably footedness, perhaps stance, helps facilitate more complex acquisition of skills. Which brings us to Jim Bowen's up-down ornithopter. <laughs> Can avian models give us clues as to how to connect or enhance genes or sites that return, restore, or enable functions? Um, in I would argue that it's useful to look at some of these models of how they build lateralized function in terms of functional neurology and neurosurgery, where we're, in essence, taking a model that's a little bit more like the bird model than the human model to supersede white matter to deliver therapies, for instance, in epilepsy. So here's a neuropace device where we're surveying the hippocampus, looking for abnormal activity, and then zapping it as soon as we can. Can we use networks and pathways in different ways of building models of brain function that, that help us move beyond where we are and give more restorative or more effective function? One of the groups that uh, Clayton, in the review article of bird modeling and cognitive neuroscience, suggests we use are corvids or crows. So the crows, if you ever watch them, they're just fun birds to watch. They have facial recognition, they form societies, they use tools around Green Lake, for instance, in October, you'll see them go onto the uh, chestnut trees and grab the chestnuts, fly them up, drop them onto the road so that the cars will smash the nut open, and then they'll jump down and feed on the nuts. So they use tools, they can mimic their, uh, they have song abilities, they give gifts. Laura, our epilepsy nurse, frequently receives gifts from her friendly crow. Uh, they have uh, object permanence, they grieve, and they play. So they're a very sophisticated bird in ways that once you start looking at them, you can get a sense that they have very human-like attributes despite the cooler part about them, which is they can fly. So 
like to just tie things up. Here's a, uh, it's not quite a corvid, an Australian magpie, but it has extremely corvid-like similarities. They mimic, they play, they facially recognize. And if you're a true Aussie, you've been swooped by these guys numerous times during breeding season. So you have a healthy skepticism of the danger they can cause you. So that's my son, Jack, playing with a magpie. And I just wanted to thank everyone who helped contribute. Laura, Alan, Wesley, Katie, Steve Shin, and the photographers who, who let me use uh, their images today. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Jim. So do you think uh, language lateralization happened 100 million years ago, or is this conversion? So are you implying that, say, dinosaurs might have had language, or? Well, did the uh, brain's lateralization occur way back then? And we continue to have parallel tracks in lateralized brains, or uh, did we just somehow become lateralized more recently? Well, so we've been around, humans have been around, say, 300 to a million, 300,000 to a million years sort of evolution of humans. The osprey's been around 11 million years, and the rate of which we've developed language in light of that seems to me extraordinary, and probably suggests that our ability to lateralize language specifically is, is um, enormously adaptive and useful in ways that other animals haven't been able to develop. So I, I doubt it was around 300 million years ago. I, who knows, though? <laughs> it's just fun to speculate. But yeah, it's the, our abilities to use language are simply extraordinary. Steve. Just a kind of speculation question about navigation and how, in humans, how lateralized it is. I, this is just an observation, but I have known people who say, pre-Google Maps, they don't understand concepts of north, south, east, west. And if you try to give directions that way, they, you have to use landmarks. The only way they can get to a certain place would be by landmarks versus conventional sort of navigational. Is that a lateralization thing, or do you think that's just a, well, that, a, a learning thing? Yeah, that sounds like, Steve, that, that the folks you're talking about is the familiar landmark uh, learned uh, visual memory versus an innate system, a navigational system, where you can put a set of coordinates in, basically according to to nomenclature that's recognized, and then develop uh, a kind of map or conception of where you should be going. So, I've always found it interesting to be with people who have zero sense of navigation <laughs> versus people who are extraordinarily good at it and who don't need maps. And um, it, it strikes me as a skill that, um, you know, it gets boiled down to, you know, this person doesn't know directions. But, but I think it's a skill that we don't know quite how to, to measure or to establish. But some people are extraordinary at it and others are terrible at it. Certainly in the epilepsy world, we'll see it with folks with right mesial temporal sclerosis, that their, their map-based visual memory ain't so great in terms of navigating. And you can get a history that's very characteristic that over time they used to be good at navigating uh, without you know, directions. But now they're not, and they get lost easily. You can argue another way, too, that, say, in the Alzheimer population, that that skill, regardless of whether it's the familiar man landmark or the navigational map, that it is eroded. Uh, the wandering Alzheimer patient being a classic example of just having no idea or no concern or no ability to gauge threat based on their map presence. Sven. I just want to add in that context that there's only among the pilot population, there's two camps. There's the, the pilots that love moving maps that are track up, and then the ones that love to have it keep north up. It's, there's a huge division between these two. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which one are you? I'm not. <laughs> it drives me nuts when the when the map drives me wrong. <laughs> For being. Um, in your reading of the literature, did you come across any short-term or long-term effects of forced lateralization that is writing or using the non-dominant site more than the dominant? I was wondering about 
engaging different pathways of neuroplasticity having an effect on neurological disease. There have been some studies in Parkinsonism, but they haven't borne out. And I was curious if there have been studies in epilepsy as well. Uh, I don't know about epilepsy, but I didn't come across any in this work on birds. I, I, there, there may be some degree of forced lateralization in the visual. I guess the easiest way to think of that is there are studies where forced lateralization of chicks occurs by obscuring one eye to light. So that's a, there's enormous data on that and using just one eye covered versus uncovered, what do you get when that happens? But then to make someone use one side more than the other, I, I'm not familiar. Yes. I think this is a, um, if there's a situation where there's a huge evolutionary advantage towards some sort of specialization, could lateralization be seen as almost like an evolutionary shortest path between like where we are now and how to get to that specialization as opposed to other evolutionary routes? Is that a good thing? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that statement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which means I don't have to answer it. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Eric, did you have a question? No, okay. All right, well, thank you, everybody.